so just to recap where we were the last time um we discussed so just let me maybe you know we discussed the spectral norm which we defined to be um maximum square root of lambda where lambda is an eigen value of a hamitian a and the spectral radius which we define to be rho of a is the maximum magnitude eigen value where lambda is an eigen value of a okay we also saw that uh, rho of a is less than or equal to the norm of a for any matrix norm and um, if um, there is a norm such that norm of a is less than 1 then limit um k tending to infinity a power k is equal to 0 and such matrices were called convergent and we saw that a is convergent if and only if rho of a is less than 1 and further this rho of a it's a it's a lower bound on any uh, norm of a and it's also the greatest lower bound in the sense that given a in c to the n cross n and epsilon greater than 0 there exists a norm such that rho of a or the norm of a is between rho of a and rho of a plus epsilon so in other words i can find a norm such that the norm of a will be as close to rho of a as i wish and further uh, the spectral radius can be used to bound the entries of a power k so if a is in c to the n cross n and epsilon is greater than 0 there exists a constant c such that a power k i j is less than or equal to c times rho of a plus epsilon power k and this is for true for every k i and j we also saw that a is invertible if there is or there exists a matrix norm such that norm of i minus a is less than 1 and if so a inverse is equal to sigma k equal to 0 to infinity i minus e power k so uh, about this i made a note the last class that uh, uh, a may be invertible if say rho of i minus a is greater than 1 i e 
norm i minus a is greater than 1 for all matrix norms. Okay, so uh, I just want to maybe um, make this point a little more clear because I think the last time it was not uh, entirely clear the way I said it. So basic logic says that if you have a statement A and if we say A implies B, then it means, so if A implies B, then not B, which I'll write as B complement, implies A complement, but B does not imply A. Okay, this is the basic uh, rules of logic. Now, in this case, what is A? A is the statement that there is a norm such that norm of i minus a is less than 1. The statement b is that a is invertible. Okay, and so now let's uh, look at these statements and see what they mean. So what the result says is that a is invertible if there is a matrix norm such that norm of i minus a is less than 1. So that means if it is true that there is a matrix norm such that i minus a is less than 1, then a is invertible. That implies that a will be invertible. So this a, norm of i minus a less than 1, this a implies b. So this is true for these two statements I've as I've written here. Now, what is B complement here? B complement is that A is singular. Okay, so B complement, so if A is singular, it means the complement of A. What is A complement? A is the statement that there is a norm such that norm of i minus a is less than 1. The opposite of this statement is that norm of i minus a, there is no norm such that i minus a norm is less than 1, which means i minus a is greater than or equal to 1 for all matrix norms or for any, let's say. Okay, so it means, so B complement implies A complement is the statement that if A is a singular matrix, then if you compute norm of I minus A, you will always get a number that's greater than 1, no matter which norm you pick. Okay, and what is B does not imply A here? B is the statement that A is invertible. It does not imply that there must be a norm such that norm of I minus A is less than 1. So B does not imply A. In other words, it is possible that there is a norm such that I minus A is greater than 1, but A is invertible. Okay. So the invertibility of A does not imply the existence of a norm such that I minus A norm is less than 1. But if this condition is satisfied, there is a norm such that I minus A is less than 1, then A will be invertible. I hope that is a little more clear than how we discussed it the last time. And uh, at the end of the previous class, we saw the Banach lemma. Which said that if B is an N cross N matrix and this is an operator norm, then if norm of B is less than 1, then I plus B is invertible. And 1 plus norm of B 
inverse is less than or equal to norm of i plus p inverse is less than or equal to 1 minus norm of b inverse. Okay. So one thing I'll say is that a form like i plus b arises very frequently in, in many problems. Um, and I'll show you an example today of where you'll end up with a form that looks like i plus b. And then what happens is you know something about this matrix b. In particular, if you know some norm of that matrix, this allows you to bound the norm of i plus b inverse in terms of how big the norm of uh, norm of b is. So that's why these kind of results are useful. OK, now. Um, uh, so this is basically about the recap of uh, what we did uh, last time. Um, OK, so. Um, yeah. Uh, sir, could you uh, explain the difference between any and every? In this context? Yes, yes. There is no difference. OK. So the thing is that now. Uh, yeah, so. In, in this kind of context, there is no difference between any and every. Now, where it will make a difference is, for example, if A were a random matrix, okay, then you would be associating a probability with which this event will happen you'll say i minus a is greater than or equal to 1 with probability greater than uh, 1 minus epsilon or something like that. In those kind of contexts, there is a difference between saying any and every. <coughs> what you mean by any is that you will fix a norm first and then you will take different, different instantiations of this matrix A and you will look, you will try to see what is the probability that or what is the number, of, what is the percentage number of cases where I minus A norm is greater than or equal to one. And that is the probability that you're bounding when you say for, for any matrix norm. But when you say for every matrix norm, what you will do is you will pick an instantiation of A and you will ask what is the probability that all matrix norms of I minus A are greater than one, greater than or equal to one. And a matrix fails this if there is a norm for which norm of i minus a is less than one. And then you ask if I take different different instantiations of this matrix A, what is the probability of success of this event? This is well beyond what we want to cover in this course, but uh, I mention this only to tell you that in this context, uh, any and every are actually this one and the same because we have fixed the matrix A. We're only looking at whether this norm is greater than or equal to one for this given single matrix A. But when we start talking about random matrices, uh, there is a difference between any and every. OK, so there's just one or two more uh, results I want to mention. Uh, so one use of um, this result, which says that if there is a norm uh, such that the norm of i minus a is less than one, then the matrix A is invertible, is in showing uh, the following uh, corollary, which is called the Levy, Levy, the Planck theorem. OK, so which says A the n cross n and suppose mod 
AII is greater than sigma j equal to 1 to n j not equal to i mod aij for i equal to 1 to up to n. What does this mean? It means that if I take the diagonal entry and I compare that with the sum of the magnitudes of all other entries in the same row but all across all other columns then uh, the diagonal entries magnitude is strictly bigger than the sum of all other entries in magnitude in the same row and such matrices are called diagonally dominant matrices and they are very important from a matrix theory point of view we are going to see a lot lot more about Again, with because um, in in many signal processing manipulations, you end up with matrices which are diagonally dominant. So, for example, if you think about computing the covariance matrix of a random weight vector, the diagonal elements of the covariance matrix represent the individual variances of these random uh, random variables while the off diagonal entries represent the cross covariances between these random variables and typically the cross covariances are small compared to the variances of the random variable and so under some assumptions of course about the um, underlying set of random variables that you are looking at these cross covariances could be small enough that the matrix satisfies a property like this and so then everything we say about diagonally dominant matrices apply to covariance matrices of such kind of uh, kind of a matrix dominant then a is invertible so this is interesting because what it says is that so if I if I take a two cross two example, let's say, and let's say just for fun, I write two and then seven here. Now I'm allowed to write for, for variety, I'll say minus seven. I'm allowed to write any number here or and any number here with the only requirement that the magnitude of this number. So I call it X. The magnitude of X must be smaller than two. And I can, I'll call this y, then magnitude of y must be smaller than 7. You can, you can try your luck with putting down any number here. It could even be a complex number. Here, this will always be invertible. Okay, that's just to give you an idea of what this theorem is saying. So, Let's show this. So AII is strictly bigger than the sum of all the off diagonal terms in the same row. And these are all non-negative because it's the magnitude of some number. So what this means is that this, this itself is greater than or equal to zero, which means AII is strictly bigger than zero. by the hypothesis that means that all the diagonal entries of this matrix are strictly positive so if i take the matrix d defined to be diag of a11 through ann this will be invertible it's a diagonal matrix with strictly positive uh, entries, uh, strictly positive magnitude entries. In fact, the inverse of this is just A11 inverse, A22 inverse up to ANN inverse. So then, if I consider the matrix B equal to I minus D inverse A, what this will do is, this is a diagonal matrix which is operating on A. So what happens to the diagonal entries 
the diagonal entries get scaled the first uh, first diagonal entry will scale get scaled by a11 inverse the second diagonal entry of this matrix will get scaled by a22 inverse and so on and so when i consider d inverse a all its diagonal entries will be equal to 1 and so this matrix b will have this identity matrix of of course has ones on the diagonal so when i subtract these out the 1 and 1 will cancel and this matrix will have has zeros on the diagonal and for the off diagonal entries it will have minus a i j over a i i as i j the entry i not equal to j okay this is just the fact that when i'm pre multiply by a diagonal matrix every row of a gets scaled by the corresponding entry of d inverted now um, consider the of course the off diagonal terms in the identity is zero so it becomes zero minus a i j divided by a i i which is minus a i j over a i i okay now let's consider specifically the uh, max row sum norm so you can already probably start seeing how this proof works out i'm going to add up the entries across each row in magnitude and then i'll take the maximum value now since sigma j equal to 1 to n j not equal to i mod a i j over mod a i i is less than 1 for every i okay and now i'm doing j not equal to i but the corresponding i comma i entry of b is just zero so when i compute the row sum norm each of them will be some number like this and it's less than one and why is this less than one it's because of this condition here i'm just taking mod ai to the other side so this summation the summation of j equal to one to n aij over aii for uh, is going to be less than 1. And this is true for every i, which implies that the norm of B infinity, which is just the max of all these guys, is also going to be less than 1. So B infinity is less than 1. That is, this the L infinity norm of this is less than 1. So there is a norm such that the norm of i minus d inverse a is uh, less than 1, which then means that i minus b, which is equal to d inverse a, is invertible. But d is a non-singular matrix, so which implies that a is invertible. Okay, so basically all diagonal dom dominant matrices are invertible. Can you please repeat the point why A is invertible? See, this From is a product of two matrices. Okay, a product of two matrices will be invertible only if both the matrices are invertible. Uh, you've seen that already in previous classes. Also, you've done homework problems on it. That uh, if uh, if you write a matrix as a product of two matrices, and if that matrix is invertible, then each of the constituent matrices must be invertible. 
Okay, okay, so now um, there are just a couple of more points before I, want, I, I close out uh, this particular line of discussion, um, which has to do with, uh, remember we talked about equivalence of vector norms. There is a similar thing we can say about uh, equivalence of matrix, norm, matrix norms. Sir, so the converse mm -hmm. is valid or not in above theorem? Which theorem? Um, do all invertible matrices are need to be diagonally dominant? Ah, what do you think? Is this matrix invertible? Yes. Of course, right? Oh, His determinant yes. is, mi is minus yeah. one, right? Yes. Yes. In fact, sir. its inverse is itself, right? You multiply this matrix by itself, you'll get the identity matrix. Yes, sir, I got it. It's not diagonally dominant. So again, uh, it's a good point because all these theorems are usually very carefully stated. Um, if there's any error in the, if there's any anything weird or inconsistent in the statement, that's purely my mistake in uh, in writing the theorem down. The textbook actually is very very good. The theorems Hello. are all extremely carefully stated, and so uh, when it says if, so what it's saying is if a matrix is diagonally dominant, it will be invertible. It does not mean that every invertible matrix will be diagonally dominant. The converse is not true. Hello. Yes, please. Uh, that uh, matrix which you have represented above, that is 0, 1, 1, 0. So is there any name for yes. it? Uh, Anti-diagonal? No, sorry. It's a permutation matrix. OK, OK. See, if I multiply x, y, okay. what I'll get is y, x. OK. Okay. It permutes the entries of the vector. It's a okay. permutation matrix. And permutation matrix have lots of very nice properties. OK. OK. And this is a, an example of a two cross two permutation matrix. Uh -huh. Of course, the only other permutation matrix in the two cross two is the identity matrix, which doesn't do any permutation actually. Okay. It's the identity permutation because you have only two entries. You can either keep them where they are or you can exchange them. Nothing else you can do.